Well, brethren, as you go ahead and grab your seats, for those of you that have your Bibles with you, if you want to go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6. And while the rest are grabbing their seats, just a, a couple quick thoughts just to share with you guys before, before I begin. I just wanted to first thank each of you that have prayed for me. Um, thank you for the, the stream of texts and WhatsApp messages this morning. They are encouraging to the soul to know that brethren are praying for you. So thank you very much. The second thing just to mention as we begin, we're going we're gonna to look at a portion of Scripture that, that all of us probably are very, very familiar with. We, we, it's, it's, a, it's a text about Christ, and it's a text about a miracle of Christ. It's something that, that we've heard about many, many different times. And I know even in my own life, one of the things that can happen is if I am very familiar with a text of Scripture... Sadly, I can kind of skim over the top of it and I can forget to go as deep as I really should to see the depth of what is there for us. And so as I, as I read the text of Scripture for us here in a moment, I would just implore you, I'd encourage you if you can, as much as you're able with just with fresh ears, just listen to this familiar text and seek to take in just the miraculous power that we are told about our Savior as he performs the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. We're in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30. And Mark records this wonderful miracle in this way. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he, speaking of Christ, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and they said, This is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and to buy themselves something to eat. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the loaves, the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Father, we are thankful to be here today. We are thankful to have the Word of God that has been preserved for us. We are thankful to know of this miracle of even this physical provision that You gave to so many. And Lord, I would ask on behalf of my brethren that You would just use this, this meager mouth. You'd speak through me. You'd help them to see You more clearly. Father, I'm, I'm joyful to look out and to see image bearers of God before me. And Lord, we just want to rejoice in who You are. We want to be built up. We want to be encouraged. And so, Father, help. Oh, so much, even this morning, Lord, You've heard me. Help. 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 Lord, help us. We are thankful, though, to so joyfully receive from You. May this time be Yours. Amen. Amen. 
So as we begin to look over this miracle, I want you to have just kind of a basic understanding of where we're going to be going. My intention today is not to just kind of camp out on just a few words and look into them and exposit them for you, but kind of just to, to fly over the fullness of this text actually two times and to give you a glimpse from a couple different perspectives um, of, of just seeing what's going on. And so if you want to set an outline, if you like outlines to follow through those, we're going to look very briefly at a context of kind of what's going on in this portion of Scripture. We're going to look at the plight of the disciples and what they had throughout this, this time of the miracle. And then we're going to follow that up with Christ in the midst of the miracle and, and looking at, at His reactions and the things that He was doing and we will finally we begin or finish with something very amazing of seeing the gospel played out for us very much in the feeding of the 5,000. So let's just jump right into it and get going. Let's look at the context and just kind of see uh, what's here, what's some general, general information that we can gather and move on. So like I said earlier, you know, most of us were familiar with this, especially if you grew up in church probably in some children's Sunday school class, you heard about the feeding of the 5,000, followed up with some fun little coloring sheet and coloring in the fishes and the loaves. You know, we, we, we know this story. We've heard, we've heard it before. Um, and maybe, maybe it's good. Maybe it's right that it's such a well-known miracle because it's the only miracle that Christ performed that's actually in all four of the Gospels I came to find out. And so, obviously, if something's recorded for us more than once, let's perk our ears, let's open our eyes and pay attention to what, what we see <clears throat> Excuse me, recorded over and over again. Um, if we look at, at each of the accounts, so if we were to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we'd see a very similar story, but with, with any other account as well, um, you know, the, the, the writers are going to give a little bit different perspective on kind of what's going on. One thing that we do see, um, John kind of separates himself a little bit on this miracle. And, uh, and the other three, as far as contextually, what we see is how our, how our Scriptures are laid out. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all kind of join the beheading of John the Baptist right before uh, right before this miracle it takes place. And then Mark and Luke, right before that, they include um, the 12 apostles being sent out on that first set of ministry that they were doing. And that's kind of important just to kind of hold here for a minute uh, as we begin to now just turn our attention to the disciples. And I, I know you've heard it said before, and, but I'll, I'll gladly say it again that you know, as we look at the lives of the disciples, we're likely going to see a lot of things that are similar about our own lives, right? Um, here they are men that are following after Christ just as, as, as we are following after Christ. And so... I want you to kind of be thinking about yourself, and I'll bring, I'll bring a few things out to help you do that as we're looking at, at them uh, in this recording of the, the miracle. But Mark starts off by telling us that the disciples have just returned from this very busy period of ministry. He records that earlier in this chapter so we know kind of when it was happening. And we know how busy they were because Mark even goes to the point of, of telling us in what we read that, that they didn't even have any leisure time even to sit and eat. So there, there's a lot going on. There, there's a real busyness that's happening um, for them at this period of time. So upon their return, Christ tells them, he said, boys, we're going to go away. We're going to rest for a while probably. That was something that many of them, they heard that and they thought, oh, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to just to be still, to rest a little while um, because of all that had been going on. So as they, they get ready, they embark, they get in the boat, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, and I, I don't know how big the Sea of Galilee is, but maybe, maybe as they're looking from side to side, potentially they, they can kind of see these figures that are moving in the same direction that they're going I don't know what their thoughts may have been at that time, but here they, they dock on the shore and all that they see is not a desolate place, 
but they see masses of people. And we're told very clearly what Christ's reaction was to those people, to those masses. None of the gospel accounts actually give us a a clarity of how the disciples reacted, how they felt. But I think it could be be possible if, if we, we do see them as just men as they are. You know, did they, would they have reacted the way that we might have? Would it be possible that, that they felt this uh, excitedness because they were getting a time of rest and then they saw all the people and this increased weariness began to sit in? Or may, maybe they got just frustrated because they thought, we have just dealt with you for so long. Can we have a break? J- just, just a day. Did they get irritable? Did they, were they feeling exasperated? Were they feeling angry? I mean, like I said, we don't, we don't exactly know. But I think it's, it's possible that, that we could maybe see that in their lives in that time. Um, we may have reacted the same way if we were there. I mean, we could, let, let's, let's bring it home to ourselves even and let's think about that. You've had a very busy day at work. You've, you've had a lot of ministry going on. You, you've had so much schooling going on. Uh, whatever it may be, there, there's things happening. You finally get to that place of rest and something comes in and snatches it away and you're like, ah, praise the Lord. No, you, you're, you're, you're kind of bothered by it and you're like... Man, I just want to sit down. Can't I just chill out for a little bit? Even as parents, right? We love these blessings that God has given to us. And at the end of the day, we're ready to just sometimes to sit and rest. You finally get everything cleaned up. Everything's done. You sit down. And then one comes out. And then one cries out from their room. And then one is kicking the wall in the room. It's like, doesn't parenting stop at 8 o'clock? Like, I just want to be still and ready myself for the day even tomorrow. You know, God has done amazing things though because even though everything here, it seems to be lost. You know, they they see like this opportunity we had, it's gone. (laughs) And yet, can we believe that God just left those, those disciples in despair and just left them like, well, you did all this other ministry. You're on your own now. You've figured out enough. No, we're told that Christ has compassion on the crowds. And surely then, God comes along. He supplies need for these disciples to then continue even another day of ministry that they didn't think that they could handle. We've got to believe that because of who our God is. I mean, we know these Scriptures that, that tell us about the, the power of God that's made perfect in our weakness. Do, did these guys feel weak? Absolutely. I'm sure they did. And you know, we're told about being able to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. The disciples may have even been, this, been familiar with the text in Isaiah that, that tells us that He gives power to the faint and to Him who has no might, He increases strength. Brethren, take comfort. Take comfort in remembering that that even in overwhelming situations even that we find ourselves in that our Lord will come along he will be our strength he will be our help he will be our comfort he's going to give us what we need to 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 show Christ to what to whatever is going on to these people around us and I'll, I'll just I would even just encourage you Later today or at some point, think, take time just to think, when has the Lord done that for me? And I'll just give you an example in my own life that's just been so encouraging and increasing in my own faith. Every single Wednesday that we have Grace Group, I am exhausted without fail. I never go through one of those days where I just, it's like I get home and my, my eyes are almost closed and Leah's like, babe, you look tired. And it's like, yeah, I could probably fall on the floor and fall asleep. But without fail, we go and the Lord helps and He strengthens and being even around the body, then it's such a blessing to get to be with one another and just to share of all that Christ has done. Brethren, remember those times. Remember what God has done. He's worth remembering in all of these things that we may give Him praise and glory and honor for how great He is. So as we go back to this miracle, the day of ministry for them, it's drawing to a close. 
And I, I've heard different men kind of make different suggestions of, of kind of what's going on as, as the, the day is coming to a close. And, you know, some of them have said, oh, the, the, the disciples have watched Christ and so they've grown in compassion and now they're wanting to help and to feed the, the, the people that are there. Other people are saying, yeah, they're probably looking for a way out. <laughs> um, how can we actually get this rest that we were hoping to get? Um, but nonetheless, the disciples go to Christ and they've got this idea that they think is a wonderful idea. Um, we've got a plan. We're going to send the people away and they're going to get food one way or another. But guaranteed, <laughs> none of them saw what was coming next. They tell the Lord their plan. They've got the people that need to go away and He says, you give them something to eat. Nobody was ready for that. Surely, perplexed looks on the faces of all the disciples just thinking, what did He just say? And maybe even asking again, excuse me? Uh, and, and then what do they say? They say, I don't have the ability to provide even if I had almost a year's worth of wages here, that wouldn't, even, that wouldn't even get enough bread to give everybody a little. Excuses. Right? They've got, they're just full of excuses of why they cannot do what the Lord just told them to do. Again, how, how many times, even, even in, in our own lives, do, do we sense maybe a direction or a prompting of the Lord to go and do something, and the first thing that we we think or that we say to the Lord is, I don't think that's going to quite work out. I don't quite have the ability to do that. Maybe you forgot who you were talking to. Lord, maybe you were supposed to go to this other brother. You know, our, our mentality can be just totally right there in line with what the disciples were saying. And sadly, as I was thinking about that, it's, it's not really that uncommon amongst the people that the Lord uses often. You know, if, we, if we run all the way back to the beginning almost of the Old Testament, we have Abraham. You know, the, the Lord comes to Abraham. He tells him he's going to build a nation out of him. And, and, and he laughs. And he thinks, no, 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 no. no. You, you forgot how old we were, God. You know, he, but, whoa, whoa, but I got Ishmael. Here, here. You take, you take Ishmael. You build a nation out of him. He's got an excuse for why it's not going to work out because he's too old. Or you've got Moses. Moses is standing there in front of this burning bush that's not actually burning, that's speaking to him, telling him to go back to Egypt. And he's like, whoa, whoa, you know, I, I'm slow with speech. Can't really talk. Not, not going to be able to do that for you. Let's think about Gideon. Gideon has the Lord come to him, and then Gideon realizes, you know what? God totally forgot the family that I'm in. And he, he has to tell God his heritage. He's got to say, you know, I'm, I'm from the tribe of, of Manasseh. We're the weakest tribe out there. And just to bring it even closer to home, uh, you know, me, I'm the least in my father's house. So sorry, <laughs> you need to go find somebody stronger, more capable. I can't do this for you. And then we've got, we've got Jeremiah. We've got the prophet to the nations. There in the first chapter, God is calling him to, to, to be his prophet. And what, it, what does Jeremiah do? Whoa, God, you, you totally forgot when you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I'm just like this youth. I, I'm not old. But nobody's going to listen to me. I don't know what I'm going to say. There's just excuses upon excuses upon excuses that the, the people of God sometimes can have and they forget what God tells almost all of these accounts. God says, you forgot that I am God Almighty. You forgot that I am the one who can supply. I am the one who is going to put words in your mouth. I'm the one who's going to help you. Go. I am with you. Brethren, let us not forget that either. Let us not forget when these impossible mountains come up before us that our God is with us and we can move forward. In a similar way, Christ doesn't accept the excuses of the disciples either. And he, and he kind of asks them a really interesting question. And, and then he gives them a direction. And he, and he says, well, what do you have? Why don't you go find out? And so the disciples go out and then they return and they've got this little meager, sem seemingly worthless bit of food to give 
back to Christ and like, well, we got this. Um, and, and isn't that incredible that Christ receives it? He doesn't just say, ooh, I thought there might be some more. You know, like, he's not, he, he's not intimidated by it whatsoever. He takes it, he receives it, and he blesses it. And then he gives it right back to them and says, boys, take it out to the masses. Albeit in a much greater amount. It, it multiplied incredibly. So what do we take from that then? What can we learn as the people of God today from, from this miracle in light of the disciples? And, and I think there's, there's a few things we can, we can look at briefly. And first, even when we think that we do not have much to offer, do not put a limit on what God can do with it. Um, we, we can think about that in a whole variety of different aspects. We can think, you know, I don't really have much money to give, so I don't know, maybe I shouldn't even give it. Or, or you know what, I don't really have that much understanding of how to explain this particular thing, and so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. The thing that really stood out to me, though, is I've been studying this text is about gifting. And I want to just park here for just a moment. And I want, I want you to think about this. God, God has given gifts to all of His people, right? He's not left any of us alone. He's not been like, well, you guys, here's some gifts. You guys, I hope you can benefit from them. It's, it encompasses the whole body of Christ. Now, I recognize there's different gifts that we've been given. There's some that, that are used in a more visible way. And, and then there's some that, that are not seen that much. Does that make that unseen gift any less of a gift from God for the advancement of His kingdom? Absolutely not. If, and I, just to be honest with you, if, if you've got this idea at all that what you have is not, you know, I'm not a preacher. I, I, I'm, I'm not much of a speaker. I you know, I'm not teaching even in the Sunday school class. I don't lead a grace group. I'm not a missionary out on the field. We don't have much money. You know, I'm, I'm very simple in my understanding of Scripture. And, you know, it's just, I don't really have anything that I can offer to the body. I don't have anything that I can offer to God. Brethren, if, if you've got that mindset, I would, I would, I would just plead with you, Run! Run from that lie. Run. Because, because all, that, all that's going on right there is the devil is creeping in and he's lying to you about what God, the Almighty, has given to you. He's trying to say, you're worthless. But God has given that to you for a benefit to this body. He has given you that gift for the, for the nations, for the world around you. Your sphere of influence may not be as big as others, but that doesn't matter. That gift that you have is totally worthwhile. And if the devil can get in and start lying to enough people about how their gifts are not worthwhile and they need to just sit there and just absorb and not actually use their gift, there could be havoc that is just wreaked on this whole congregation and the church at large. What do you have to give? What has ultimately God given to you? <laughs> Might even be the better question. Whatever it is that He has given to you, I would just encourage you, use it. Use it. Use it for His glory. We must do that. We, we've got to just to, to honor the Lord through that. So, brethren, I, I want you to take that. That was something that has been so helpful for me. Because even in my own life, there have been times where, where I've exalted one measure of gifts and I've thought, you know, I don't really, I'm not there. And I, I feel like I've kind of, I think I've got this, but I'm not there. So what, what's, maybe it's not even worth trying to use this. Oh, whenever there was light upon that and I realized and there was freedom then to use what God had given me, oh my goodness, amazing just this joy that filled my soul to just be able to, to honor the Lord with what he had given me and to be the person of God 
who He made me to be. So brethren, use the gifts that God has given to you, even though you may see them as small. Secondly, the disciples, how, we want to ask how much did they give? How much of what they have did they give? Well, they gave all of it, right? <laughs> they went out, they searched, they brought all of what they had, and they gave it to Christ. It's not like Peter took a couple fish and stuck it in his knapsack in case things just kind of went sour on the deal, right? They entrusted everything to Christ. Ought we not be doing the same with all in our lives? And lastly, we see about how when they gave everything to the Lord, what did He do? He gave it right back to them. He blessed it. He gave it back to them. And He said, you are now my hands and my feet. Go. It's not even a work specifically that Christ then took all these, these pieces of, of bread and the fish and He said, okay, I've got it. Here, here's some for you and for you and for you. Right? He said, boys, here, take these. Take them out to the people. They were the workers for Him. They were His hands. They were His feet. The disciples weren't the ones who were actually expected to perform the miracle, were they? They were the ones who were expected to receive humbly what Christ had done and then faithfully distribute it to the people that were there. Um, when their hands were empty, what did the disciples have to do? Obviously, they probably, I wouldn't think that they had, you know, I don't know what the math would come out to be, but like a twelfth of the 5,000 um, of stuff with them, right? Um, they probably had to keep going back to Christ who continued to multiply the loaves and the fishes. Ought we not do the same? When we run empty, where do we go? Back to Christ. And we receive again from Him. He will continue to supply. So let us never think that we're the ones who've got to do the miracle. We just need to be faithful with what the Lord has given to us to then hand out. So, let me grab a drink real quick. And so jump right back up to the top again with me and let's run through this again, but looking at Christ. And we'll see some differences and we'll see some miraculous things in the life of Christ through this miracle as well. So there's five, five aspects that I just want to touch on about Christ. And these are, these are characteristics that we see vividly portrayed here in this, um, in this miracle that I would even argue to say that are very active and present in our Lord today as He sits upon the throne ruling and reigning um, we have a Lord that never changes, praise God. So the first thing that we see, we, we touched briefly on this earlier, but we see that upon the disciples' return, Christ has a concern and a care for His disciples that He has sent out. Um, if we were to look in Matthew's account, one thing I found interesting, in Matthew's account, like I said, it's right after the, the beheading of John the Baptist. And the way that Matthew links those two together is he says that, that Jesus finds out about it and then he goes off to a desolate place by himself. Okay? But what, it, what do we read here in Mark? We have the twelve sent out, we've got the beheading of John the Baptist, and then we've got Jesus sees his disciples coming back to them and he says, we're going to go away for a while. We don't actually see that he's thinking about his own needs in that time. We don't see that he's thinking about the death of his cousin in that time, but he's actually thinking about others, right? He's thinking about, about the disciples that have been out and they have been ministering and he's, his care is for them. Um, he shows himself in that to be a very selfless Savior. And he shows this concern that, it, that, that he's going to say, we're going to go away and to rest for a while. We're going to be still for a while. And I don't think the thought in Christ's mind, obviously, was like, boys, we're going to go just kind of hang out, and we're going to go sit on the green grass, and we're going to sing Kumbaya, and it's going to be wonderful, and then we'll go back and do some more ministry. I don't think it was like that at all. I think that the, what Christ was wanting to do was saying, you guys have been ministering, and I want to bring you away and we're going to spend time together and I'm going to minister to you. And, and so I think it's, it's good for us to remember that. That there are going to be those times, just like we see in, in Psalm 23, where, 
where David tells us about how the Lord, our shepherd, is going to give us rest. And He is going to lay us down uh, in green pastures. And He is going to lead us beside, literally, waters of rest. Um, There is going to be a restoring of our soul. And we should embrace those times. That's a good time to be with the Lord. Um, and it's good to take, take those times that he gives us. Don't, don't ever exalt this uh, being busy for God idea makes you more spiritual. Because that may not be the case. It may be you're trying to be doing, 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 doing for God when what you need to do is you need to sit and nurture your own soul. Because that's what's the most needed at that particular time. When He gives you rest, I would encourage you to embrace it and enjoy it and enjoy your Savior in those times. Um, Secondly, I'm going to look at something very small, but I think there's importance to it. Um, We're told that Christ, uh, He saw the crowd, so He's paying attention. He sees the crowd that's there before Him as they dock uh, uh, there on the shore. And I'm reminded how in the other Gospel accounts, we've got this, this same idea where it talks about how Christ sees these different people, even uh, with the rich young ruler, it says that he, he saw him and he loved him. Um, how many times do we find ourselves, we're having a conversation with somebody and we're looking at them, but our mind is totally somewhere else. We're, we're looking past them. We're not really engaged with them. And yet, as I read this and I read these different accounts in the Gospel of Christ, I see whenever Christ is seeing somebody, there's some serious paying attention to what's going on. And it's not just the outward, outward that's going on, but looking even, a, even deeper, if you will, um, and seeing even greater needs that they, they have. Um, I, would, I would encourage you in being like our Savior. Brethren, pay attention to people and, uh, and notice them. When they're talking to you, listen to them. I know that's a, that might not seem like a really spiritual thing to draw out of that, but... There, there are brethren in this room that, that I love when I get to talk to them um, because I know they're listening. I know that they're paying attention because they are looking at me. They're paying attention to me. They're not looking past me. And are we called to love? Absolutely. One way that we can love one another, one way that we can love the lost world is by seeing the people and seeing who they are and not thinking seven steps ahead of where we're maybe going to try to go with this conversation. Next, kind of related to that um, intentional observance of the crowd, we're told about our compassionate Savior. And, and we have a Savior in our Lord Jesus Christ who's not just concerned, obviously, with the physical needs of the people here. Uh, we see that He is, but He's concerned about their spiritual need. He, it says quickly that, that He had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd relating to the spiritual right away. Uh, we see that that he's concerned and ultimately coming to this earth to give himself to bear our sins. He's concerned about, about our spiritual need and our spiritual state. He's, he has pity. He has empathy. He has care um, uh, for us. And, and that's a wonderful thing to know, that we don't have this harsh taskmaster that we serve, but this caring, compassionate, loving Christ uh, we, we're, we're told even as we think about that idea of, of being sheep without a shepherd, he goes so far in the, in the Gospel of John to tell us that he is the good shepherd. And not just that he's a good shepherd, but that he's going to lay his life down for his sheep even. If we think again about Psalm 23, we get this picture um, again of our, of, our, of our shepherd Savior, if you will, who cares and he protects and he provides and he helps and he refreshes and you know, the list goes on there. Um, and we, we clearly see in that we don't have this distant Savior, but we've got one that's intimately involved with us in what we're doing. Um, and then maybe uh, this, this uh, Daryl and I have spoken about this verse uh, fairly regularly, it seems, and maybe it's a special one for parents in some ways, that in the book of Isaiah, it's, we're told that he will tend his flock like a shepherd and he will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Um, 
We want to remember just this, this great care, this great concern, this great compassion, this great love, this great provision uh, that we'll see in a minute that our Savior has to even these very specific needs of His own people as well as the, uh, the, the global restoration through, through salvation. Um, and what a, what a joy to know that we have a Savior that is compassionate Hold on to that as well. The next thing we see about Christ is that He is a providing Savior. Right? We're told that He provided all this food even. And, uh, and we, see, we see the physical sustenance that, it, that He provides. But it's really neat too to see He doesn't just provide it for His true followers. Right? There wasn't a survey that went around and kind of examined everybody's testimony and like, oh, okay, yeah, you're truly following Christ? Well, here's some bread. Right? It, it was given to all, and it was given to all freely. Um, and, it, and it seems, according to John's account of this, that there was a lot of people that were just following him for the sake of wanting to get people healed. That They wanted to see these different signs that were going on. So they may not have even been there with the right motives whatsoever. Um, but this, this provision for them is given. And obviously, that then turns our minds to the Gospel as well, that the Gospel is one that is welcome for all to receive. You know, the, our, the responsibility is then to then take it, to receive what's been given uh, by our God there. Um, and then we can take it even one step further to think about the provision of Christ Himself. You know, Craig mentioned this a few weeks back when he began Galatians about how the Lord Jesus Christ gave, or we could say, could say provided Himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. So we've got, a, we've got here a providing Savior for us. And then the last characteristic just to point out is that He is a satisfying Christ. And he, we've got Mark telling us here um, that there were 5,000 men that were involved. Matthew adds to us that, that there were women and children. Some people have then speculated that there were some twenty to 25,000 people that were actually involved uh, here in this miracle. And it tells us they were all satisfied. Now one thing that's kind of interesting just to think about too is there are those that would like to go around and kind of say, ah, the, the miracles of Christ, you know, those were just made up. They were, like, they were just a show. They were a sleight of hand. How in the world are 25 or even, even 5,000 people going to walk away and be like, man, I am satisfied. I am full to the brim. You know, we've got just, even I see in that, like that's the power of the miracles of the divine working right there. And, and God was there working, multiplying even something that wasn't there before and creating it as he did at the beginning of time. Um, but then if we take it even thinking about the satisfaction um, that, that we have, you know, let's step back a moment. You know, when we were lost, were we satisfied? You know, did, did we have what we needed to just say, oh, I am at rest, I am at peace? You know, no. no. You know, we, 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 weren't. We, weren't, we weren't truly satisfied. You know, we, we might have this momentary satisfaction, but it always faded away and yet Christ here we see you know even just using that word he's gonna satisfy and, and if we could multiply lots of scriptures and things but I guess the idea I'm just wanting you to see is we, you know, you're gonna be filled <laughs> with Christ you're gonna have enough because you're never gonna run out um, and you're gonna just be able to keep receiving more and more and more of him hope completeness satisfaction rest all found there in our Savior um, we can think about too, in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ is talking about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they're going to be satisfied. And um, just this idea of seeking after the Lord is kind of something I can, I've kind of pulled from that. You know, as we are seeking after, walking in holiness, walking after the Lord. It's not so much that because we're, we're seeking after the satisfaction, but because we're seeking after Christ that we're satisfied. You with me? Um, and just pursuing Christ, pursuing Christ, pursuing Christ, not grabbing on to all these other things that the world would seem to make so beautiful, but to truly hold on to the one that is beautiful and being satisfied in Him. Um, we're going to draw to the close of our time, and I just want to finish by seeing the Gospel 
And th- this recently just stood out to me. I'd, I've read this text for months, <laughs> and it just occurred to me, whoa, I think I was, t- I was talking to the children about it, uh, and it just it, it floored me that the scene, the gospel displayed in this. And, and before I, I, I talk a little bit about it, um, I, I know there are those of you in this room that don't know Christ. And you've just heard me describe to you a Savior that's just incredible. And my question for you is, you know, what, what's so offensive? You know, what's so unappealing? What, what's so worthless to you about this Savior that I just described that, that's caring and has concern and has compassion that's providing, that's satisfying? Why in the world would you continue to run after all the things of this world? What, what hope is in there? And I just, if, if, if you have tuned me out for the rest of the time, could you give me your ears? Just for five minutes or so as we finish. But, but we, we see, again, we see the care and the concern that Christ has for the disciples and then we see the, the care and the concern that God the Father has over mankind who's gone astray and turned to His own way. And we've seen this compassion that Christ showed to these crowds that many of them probably weren't even there because they truly loved Him, because they truly followed Him. Um, and yet, here, He cared for them. And He was concerned about their plight as being, being a sheep without a shepherd. And then even in a similar way, as we think about God the Father and the work that He does and who He is, we're told that, that He's rich in mercy. We're told that He's gracious. We're told that He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and that He will forgive. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And then we talked about even the provision of Christ. How He gave Himself for our sins to deliver us. And then we also know about the love of God where God provided, so to speak, His Son. God so loved the world that He gave. He provided His Son so that we could have eternal life. And then even thinking about Christ as He took that bread, right? And we're going to do this soon. But He took that bread and what did He do? He had to break it, right? Isn't that a picture even of His broken body for us? A broken body there for us on the tree. And then, the satisfaction that comes, although we do, we are satisfied through the Gospel, through the work of Christ. We think too that God is satisfied. His wrath has been satisfied because of what Christ has done upon the cross. So those of you, again, if, those of you that are separated from Christ, and even as Paul talks about in Ephesians of having no hope and, and without God in this world, I, I again, um, I'd ask, why, why would you not embrace this Savior? Why would you let Him go? Why would you continue to walk in your own ways? Um, he's given everything that you need for eternal life. <laughs> and yet... Many times the back is turned, right? I would encourage you today. Take these things. They're simple thoughts. I realize that. But, but what's here is enough to show you the goodness of God that would take away all of your sin through Christ. And I don't really care how much you've done. I don't care what you think you've done that's bad enough because if you're going to say, well, this sin is too bad for God to forgive, well, you don't know how great the blood of Christ is. So embrace what He has done for you. Do you need, do you need an example of that further? Well, just look around. <laughs> look around and see all of these souls that are represented throughout this room that have, they're not just a bunch of religious folk. They're image bearers of God that have been bought by the blood of Christ that are representatives of Jesus Christ on this earth. See them. See Christ within them and run (laughs) to that glorious Savior who would give Himself even for you. And believer, as we close, rejoice. Rejoice because this Savior who over 2,000 years ago, He fed over 5,000 thousand people he is the same caring he is the same compassionate providing savior satisfying savior even that we've looked at today and what a gift that we have been given uh, to be brought into his company to be brought into his family to know his love to be helped by him to to walk with him 
What a great and magnificent Savior we serve. And so in light of that, I would, again, I would just implore you with the gifts that God has given to you, would you serve Him with all that is within you? No matter what the sphere of influence that you do find yourself in, with these gifts that He's given to you, with the help that He will continually give you as you entrust your all to Him, continue just to receive humbly from Him. Distribute faithfully in the things that God's given. Be His hands. Be His feet to one another. Be His hands and His feet to this lost world. And honor Him through what He's done for you. Amen.